five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello, space enthusiasts. Welcome to another episode of the Space Business Podcast, where we investigate all the exciting ways in which people participate in the new space economy by conversations with entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and other members of the space family. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor in and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite bus manufacturer and mission integrator. Their satellite technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation for various purposes, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out and also check out my episode with their CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University, or ISU, which is also our partner in this podcast. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide, ranging from executive courses lasting a few days all the way to a one-year master's. Check them out at isunet.edu. Well, it's time for a non-business episode, and we have a great one. I caught up with Jim Green, the chief scientist of NASA. Join us on a whirlwind tour through the solar system, visiting places like Mars, Venus, and Titan, talking about astrobiology and other space science. This is a real fun one. Enjoy. Everybody, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today with Dr. James Jim Green, the chief scientist of NASA. Welcome, Jim. How are you doing? Very good, Raphael. Thanks so much for inviting me along. Sure, it's, it's a great pleasure. Let me start with the first question here. What does a chief scientist of NASA actually do day to day? Well, uh, I have a number of roles. Uh, probably the most important role is I provide independent scientific advice to the administrator. So as uh, NASA is involved in so many different science activities, uh, they're proposing new things, moving forward, trying to obtain funding from the administration and from Congress. The administrator will turn to me and say, Jim, what do you think? You know, should we be involved in this or that or what, what should we do? So uh, I've enjoyed that. This is a third year going on to my fourth year. Worked with Jim Bridenstine, who, uh, who left NASA. Sure. And uh, we have an acting administrator right now, Steve Jerzyk, uh, with a potential new administrator who has to be approved by Congress. So we'll yep. see uh, see what happens next. But uh, been been having a great time doing it. Yeah, fantastic. And so that advising the administrator, how let's say proactive versus reactive would that be? Like, are you at liberty, for example, to say like, hey, Mr. Administrator, I think we should really go to Titan and do this, or is it more reactive? <laughs> well. Uh, it's a little both, actually. Uh, uh, in my position, I also uh, have the responsibility to ensure that our scientists across our workforce, uh, in particular our civil servants and our contractors that are developing and working uh, with our scientists on missions and science activities, are taken care of, that we, we don't, don't end up with policies or procedures that um, unduly affect their work life. And that, you know, so I view a lot of what I do as try to uh, get rid of the barriers. And so um, I'm very proactive in that particular part. There'll be things that I see that uh, will need to be changed. And so I will write a position paper. You know, I'll, I'll say, here's my position on this activity. And uh, we'll go to the administrator and we'll have a couple reviews. And, and the administrator has in the past say, okay, let's make these changes. So um, that's a really good feeling when we can remove a variety of barriers for our civil servants to be able to improve their work life. For sure. But I mean, is there something like, um, you know, like uh, companies and governments would have sort of like medium long-term strategies on the NASA science side? Is there something like a medium long-term strategy? Like this is what we really want to, you know, achieve in an ideal world in the next you picked a time frame, 5, 10, 50 years, I don't know. Well, we do. Uh, we work with the National Academy in each of our major science disciplines. And uh, the National Academy connects with the science community. And in that framework, they develop the top scientific activities NASA should be involved in over the next 10 years. And we call that process the decadal report. Now, they, they don't do one report. They actually do individual report versus the discipline. So 
There'll be the astrophysics decadal. There'll be the planetary decadal. There'll be the heliophysics decadal and the earth science decadal. And so uh, each of these mark out the kind of things that need to be done and we need to move forward. Of course, um, what I like to do, you know, I've been head of planetary. I enjoy all kinds of different science. Uh, I've spent a lot of time doing a variety of Earth magnetospheric work. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've uh, done a lot of solar wind magnetospheric interactions. I've done a lot of planetary work. Uh, In fact, I wrote my first... um, exoplanet paper and got it published that came out uh, came out in January so these are these are the kind of things that then enable me I think to encourage cross discipline work and you know, what we what we learn in planetary science we ought to be able to rapidly move uh, into the hands of the astronomers who are finding exoplanets to determine did they find an Earth-sized planet or did they find an Earth-like planet, okay? Mm. Those are the kind of things that are really important, these, these cross-discipline activities. So that's a little value added that I do uh, by looking over our disciplines and supporting those activities that uh, require expertise from more than one discipline. It's much like our astrobiology activity, you know, and as head of planetary science from 2006 to 2018, I really saw the benefit of getting all these groups of scientists together that come from you know, biology and planetary science and organic chemistry and, and geology and clouds and, you know, and, and uh, uh, looking for biosignatures and how we make those measurements and, and the collaboration of multi disciplines to really go after tough topics, top topics such as looking for life is really enabled by, by bringing these groups together. So that's another one of the things that I'm responsible for doing. That sounds really refreshing because, I mean, oftentimes we criticize that at terrestrial academic institutions, it's, it's so much in d- different silos. So if you have this yeah. you know, cross-discipline approach, that sounds really refreshing. I guess it also makes sense if you're looking for life, right? You have to have an understanding of the biology of the environment sure. and, and, and everything, I suppose. So, A couple of years ago, I, I uh, worked with Mike Freilich, who was the head of Earth Science, we, we did a book, uh, we were involved in a book, it had a small, small, small role, and it was called Earth at Night. And so what we did is uh, we had uh, uh, all kinds of observations of the Earth taken by different types of satellites, but only at night, okay? So you actually could see civilization at work, all right? And so uh, we, we got a whole bunch of copies of that and went to the American Geophysical Union meeting. This was when it was at uh, San Francisco. And um, I signed copies. I signed copies of it. You know, uh, we just handed them out free. So we had line that went out the door. And so as somebody would come up, I, can, I could actually sign my name and talk at the same time. So while I'm signing, signing this person's book and I'm talking to him, I say, well, what kind of science are you doing? I, well, I'm a hydrologist. And I'd say, yeah. what planet? And they'd, they'd laugh at me. Earth, of course. And I'm going, well, what do you mean, Earth, of course? You know, do you know the hydrological cycle on Mars? Yep. Do you know that the moon actually has a water cycle? That we've uncovered. What, what do you really know about these sciences? And another person, you know, a, a volcanologist, okay? Sign in another one. And, uh, what do you do? Well, I'm a volcanologist. I said, well, what body? Ha, 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 ha. Well, Earth, of course. I'm going, do you know that Io has more volcanoes per square mile than, than any other body in the solar system? You want to know something about volcanology, you ought to be looking at Io. <laughs> You know, it resurfaced yeah. its whole the whole body in 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 eighty years, right? Yeah. Well, so that's what I'm trying to do is really get people excited about their discipline, but think about it in a different way. Think about how I can apply what I know into a different realm or regime, and that's really important. Yeah, and I mean, and you really have to, right? Because again, if you come to astrobiology, I mean, again, there's there's no yeah. guarantee, there's no guarantee that life is going to look similar. I mean, probably, but it's not. There's no guarantee it's going to look similar to life on Earth, right? So you have, you right. have a very open mind, I guess. That's right. With regard to some of these, um, you mentioned the National Academy and sort of them defining top scientific activities. What would be some current examples? Of- ah, okay. So, like in planetary science, you know, the, they're working on the new decadal right now uh, that the issue. Uh, so the decadal that we we are in, uh, where, where I was head of planetary, you know, some of the top 
strategic things that we should be doing is starting sample return, mm. bringing back samples from Mars, okay? For, and for a whole variety of reasons. It's not just for understanding the geology of Mars. It's just one of a myriad of reasons why we want to bring samples back. So indeed, as head of planetary, I took that on. You know, that was, uh, that was something we absolutely needed to do. And so after the safe landing of uh, Curiosity in 2012, it was really obvious to me that we needed to be able to leverage that structure mm -hmm. uh, and be able to then build the next uh, mission that would actually start sample return. And to start it, it's really all about creating samples. And so that's what we have now. And that's Perseverance. And Perseverance is on Mars, and it's doing fantastic you know, mm -hmm. so the decadal, you know, said this is what we need to be doing. They didn't tell me exactly how to do it. As head of planetary, I had to figure that out. And I had to work with the community, work with the administration, work with Congress to be able to get everybody uh, agreeing that, one, this is what we needed to do. Two, uh, this is a way to do it that that is the cheapest way to do it. And so you're getting real value for your money. And, and of course, by leveraging the build of Curiosity by just building a, a major replica of it and, and changing out the experiments and putting a drill on the arm. And mm -hmm. it sounds simple. It's not. But we bought down a lot of the risk because we knew how to land a one-ton rover on Mars. Well, let's do it again, right? And that's what we've got. we got a fantastic, fantastic perseverance. But what will happen in those samples, you know, they'll, uh, perseverance will create the samples. That starts in a series of another set of missions for which we're going to bring them back, mm. okay? So how we do that is uh, perseverance cores rock. The cores are like a piece of chalk, chalkboard chalk, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they're like a large Crayola crayon. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so these uh, these uh, cores then are put in a sleeve, a metal sleeve, and the metal sleeve then is sealed and then laid on the surface of the ground for later pickup. In the meantime, we're going to interrogate the hole that we created and obtain information about the provenience all around the sample that we took, where we took it, and uh, what it might contain. And then uh, the next set of missions are all about going there, finding these samples, putting them uh, in a Mars ascent vehicle, and then launching mm -hmm. them into orbit with another satellite, running them down in orbit, picking up that collected set of samples and bringing them back to Earth for analysis in our laboratory. So does, does that mean that sort of geologist is a is a good uh, hot field to to be in? It's part of the reason I was asking about the uh, the National Academy and the activities. If if somebody who's like younger and generally excited about science is listening to us, but they're still in a position to choose, or oh, I could study as my primary field, like astrobiology or geology or planetary science, is there? Is there anything that's particularly hard, or is it all of all of the above? Well, it, that's a really good question. My, my approach uh, that I would recommend would be follow your passion. If you become really mm -hmm. passionate about geology or about astrobiology or about planetary science in some aspect or earth science, really dig in, really get excited and go do it. And along the way, you know, take up the opportunities that come along. All right. Now, these samples will come back at the end of this decade. What are, what are we going to find in these samples? Well, they'll have the information about the toxicity of the soils. Now, that will mean how astronauts will be able to live and work on Mars because we'll have to deal with the toxicity. We also know geologically that uh, this rock was created over time based on the interaction of land, water, and uh, the atmosphere. And indeed, um, that will tell us the history of the planet. Uh, but also what's in the rock record is the mineralogy, the changes in mineralogy. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these changes occurred because of a variety of, uh, uh, of events. Uh, in fact, uh, there's 5,000 minerals or so here on Earth, and 300 of them could only be made if you have life. Mm. Now, that's pretty exciting because that means if we find minerals on, on Mars for which they're new, unique, and we can't uh, create them unless there was life there present in the past, you know, now we're talking about a rock record that indicates uh, that Mars was inhabited in its past. So there's just all kinds of things you can tease out, given the right samples back in the laboratory. Is there something, so this involves, um, as you described, basically the, the current like, 
currently perseverance and then picking up the samples. Ultimately, of course, some people have the um, the goal of, of of landing humans on mask uh, on on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> mask, I said mask already, like sure. and slip, right? Uh, is Understandable. There, <laughs> is there something like you know um, that that human astronauts would be able to do on the scientific research part? in a much better way than, than you could achieve with the, using the, the robotic exploration and the returns. Yeah, you can almost name anything. Okay. <laughs> and the reason why is uh, humans have the ability to do a variety of things. Our mobility is great. You know, when you look at how far Spirit and Opportunity went, Opportunity went 26 miles after, uh, you know, more than 10 years. Okay, well, we can do that, you know, in much less time, and we can also make decisions. You know, we can also see a particular area. We've analyzed uh, similar things. We don't need to spend any more time here. But this is fascinating. This is interesting. Our ability then to deploy instruments, our ability to create samples, our ability to go back, analyze them, and then go to a variety of different places quickly. There's just so many aspects that uh, humans bring into the picture that aid our ability to do science faster, better, and um, focused in many different ways. It, you know, so it's an era that um, that we're many of us now are really getting quite excited about. It. We're getting close. To being able to do that again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Humans on the moon. Humans we'll, on we'll the moon. We'll, yeah. we'll definitely talk about the moon in a minute. But sort of with the with the first element you mentioned is sort of like getting around quicker and, and easier. We have one really exciting part of the um, Perseverance missions, of course, is Ingenuity, the um, drone or the helicopter. The, the, yeah, the, the quadcopter, right? As I understand it, it's it's mostly a tech demonstration and test at this point in time, but ultimately could we use this for you know put se like actual sensor pods on it and um, that would have good, good use cases on Mars? Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, as we were developing Perseverance, uh, JPL had proposed the helicopter. We were really quite excited about, the, uh, about it, but it wasn't very mature, you know. Um, so we finally decided, okay, well, if we invest a little bit in it and it makes some major progress, uh, we ought to be able to make a decision a little later on whether it's uh, viable or not. And uh, we knew it, we always knew it was going to be a technology demonstration. And there's nothing wrong with using uh, an opportunity like, uh, like, like Perseverance on Mars to be able to bring new technology forward. In fact, Perseverance has a couple new technologies uh, in addition to Ingenuity, the helicopter. And it's just a, it's a dual blade copter, or it's not what we call a quadcopter. It's just a, a, a dual blade uh, that counter rotate. Therefore, we don't need a tail rudder. And they rotate at just, you know, 2,500 revolutions per minute. I mean, just at a phenomenal, phenomenal speed yeah. that, you know, that, that therefore we want to be able to see if we can actually, uh, in this very thin atmosphere, lift off and move. All right. And so um, this is our first attempt. Ingenuity is uh, being deployed right now. It's already um, nearly on the surface. If it's not sitting on the surface right now as we speak, it will mm -hmm. be very shortly. We'll then back away uh, from uh, from Ingenuity, uh, which was originally tucked into the belly pan of uh, Perseverance. Mm -hmm. So we'll drop it off uh, uh, at, at the landing pad, we'll, we call it. We'll pull back about 100 um, meters and then we'll send a command to uh, to turn it on and initiate the first sequence of tests. And that first sequence of test is is go up, you know, four or five uh, meters or more, and then return and land right back exactly at the same spot. Mm. Now, the reason why that test is really important is because the first time we tried it, we did it in a tank, a very large uh pump down chamber, you know, with the copter sitting in the in the middle, we then turned it on and it went to the wall. <laughs> so, so, okay. so we don't we don't want to do that. We you know yeah, you don't want to lose really the, hard. lose it right away on Mars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, difficult yeah. Well, to replace. it worked really hard to be able to do this right. You go up and come down. So that's the first test. The next test is go up and then move laterally, you know, parallel to the earth, you know, probably 10 meters or more, and then fly right back to where the landing pad is and then sit back down on it. Then the next one is to be able to make an inverted U, go up, 
I'm going to do a lateral translation parallel to the ground and then come down in a different location and then re repeat, bring, come back. And then we're really open for business. So then it has all the basic capability uh, to really be able to flex its muscle and really see what it can do. And it can it can take off and fly, you know, a kilometer away and still communicate with us. So it has a lot of capability. It has a, a two cameras in it. Okay. So it has a, a camera looking forward mm -hmm. and a camera looking down, and we're going to be taking uh, high resolution images and radio and back. It also has uh, uh, probably the fastest processor we've ever put on any space vehicle, anything, you know. And so we're testing some new technologies there. And if this works, this would be a, a model to use for future missions where we'd have a larger scale system with, with larger, of uh, course, uh, blades. But yeah. with more sophisticated instruments, you know, things yeah. that would uh, be able to, you know, taste the atmosphere, smelling the atmosphere for methane or some trace gases, which may indicate life, you know, and then take off uh, and go large distances, fly, flying up. Um, you know, Valles Marineris, you know, as I said, it took um, opportunity uh, years, 10 years or more to go uh, uh, 26 miles, you know, to do a marathon. And, 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 you know, one of these things could probably do it in a matter of a couple days, given the opportunity to charge it up and, and, and let I, her rip. So I assume they have to be, it has to be fully autonomous, right? Given the communications uh, latency, but just kind of decide Correct. what it needs to do and uh, navigates by itself. And Right, right. So we program it and execute those programs. And that's another part of it. Uh, so we have to have a fast processor to be able to make the images, to understand where it's going, what it's doing, uh, be able to do some calculations on board that then store the data and then radio it back to Perseverance. Once Perseverance has the data, then when an orbiter flies over, we'll, we'll send the data back up to the orbiter and then the orbiter will send it back, uh, back to Earth. If we didn't do that, we'd have to carry a trailer behind Perseverance with this big, huge dish. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, sure. That makes yeah, no communication sense. dish back home, back home. So we don't do that. We use yeah. our we use our orbiters as relay relay uh, spacecraft, and that's yeah. been working uh, quite well now for twenty years. And correct if I'm wrong, but if I remember correctly, this is like a test mission, and you already have the next uh, helicopter uh, mission planned in a few years time on on the on the moon of Saturn Titan right yes yeah, so the next big atmosphere we want to be able to probe in this kind of way is indeed Titan Titan is a moon of Saturn and it's quite a fascinating moon it's huge just to give you an idea how big it is has its own atmosphere the atmospheric pressure is twice that of Earth's you know so it's a heavier atmosphere so to speak it's dominated by nitrogen just like our atmosphere is and um, it's so big Big, uh, you know, it's actually bigger than the than the um, planet Mercury. So if we pulled Titan out of orbit from Saturn and had it orbit the Sun, we'd call it a planet. planet yeah. I mean, this is just a huge object. So uh, it's really uh, really spectacular. And we were so lucky to have Cassini uh, orbiting Saturn for so many years, uh, 14 or 15 years, really really taking good looks at Titan and and analyzing that data. And now we have a really good global picture of what that that uh, that beautiful moon is all about. And we even, we even landed a probe, right? Uh, the Huygens probe. We after. did, yes. In fact, uh, the European Space Agency, ESA, did a fantastic job developing the Huygens probe, and uh, it just floated down beautifully down to the ground, taking uh, spectacular measurements and images. And uh, so we have atmospheric profile of winds and temperatures and, and composition. And so we actually know an enormous amount about um, Titan from not only Cassini imaging it from uh, uh, you know the orbit, but also and and primarily from the Huygens probe that ESA developed. So from the perspective of of flying a craft there like a helicopter, so I'm hearing the much thicker atmosphere, and then I thought, oh, it must be much easier because you get much easier like lift, right? But I'm thinking, well, if there's a big atmosphere, then maybe there's like severe weather and it's more difficult. So which, which one is, is it actually, or is it both? Good question. Yeah. So there is a there is a play there you have to worry about. So. For instance, on Mars, the atmosphere is about a percent of ours, right. okay? And uh, it actually has winds, and we measure the wind velocity, and the winds will go um, 100 kilometers per second at times. Wow. I mean, when you think about it, that just that that's just, uh, 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 you know, unbelievable. But uh, the, the pressure is so low 
right. that uh, it wouldn't straighten the flag. Yes. <laughs> you know, it just, uh, it just, and therefore we, we're not too worried about uh, knocking the helicopter over. Titan, Titan, we have uh, some good indications of the winds based on the profile and Huygens probe, and the winds are different at different altitudes, uh, and so that makes a big difference. Now we think we think uh, the stability of the copter and and the winds that we'll experience on the surface, the Dragonfly, which is the name of the mission, uh, will do just fine. Yeah. So I just you gotta allow me to open a bracket there. I'm just I just just listening to you on Mars, and of course, if the atmosphere is so thin, then a storm doesn't have a big impact, as you said. Now I do remember you were a consultant on the movie The Martian, and if I remember correctly, it obviously starts. Um, um, the, you know, the astronaut gets stranded because like a dust storm is basically knocking everything around. So right. that's basically poetic license then, I, I assume. Yes, it is. You know, uh, I did, uh, I was the NASA head consultant on the Martian, coordinated um, getting Ridley Scott and his team whatever they wanted. Uh, because uh, uh, we we felt that 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 he wanted to make it realistic as uh, towards the novel. I mean, he was really yeah. he was really uh, doing a movie about the novel, and um, uh, we wanted the basic Mars look and feel uh, so that it's in the right setting. But indeed, dust storms on Mars are very different than those that were depicted in the movie. Uh, they're uh, not like that at all. The dust storm actually ends up at very high altitude. Mm. Um, in fact, it'll go up 60 kilometers. And, and as the dust builds up, then then you, what you have, if you're standing on the surface, is everything starts getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, you know, might look like twilight. And then, and then it might look like night, depending on the opacity of the dust. In other words, how much light could actually get through the dust. So then over time, that dust will settle out. It will come down slowly, comes down uh, slowly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, you'll have to go and you'll have to, you know, uh, squirt off, so to speak, um, or brush off the dust that ends up on the solar panels. But um, sure. that will occur only over time as the dust settles out of the atmosphere. Yeah. It doesn't have the power that you see in the movie. So, so man, of course, many potential things that could kill us on Mars, but storms are not one of them. Basically. Storms are not one of them. That's right. Okay, so let's stay in the inner solar system and, and move over to Venus, because obviously that planet was in the news a few months ago with, you know, the, the, well, the, the alleged, well, I think the detection of phosphine, phosphine but right. then basically um, alleging that phosphine being a, a, a biomarker, that this may have meant the detection of life. What are, what are we doing about that? Well, you know, that uh, uh, what a biomarker is all about is really finding a chemical signature that may be associated with life. Okay, so for instance, the life that we're familiar with, a biomarker for that would be methane. All life generates methane, okay? All life, all right? Even, even you know, some of the smallest life uh, here on Earth. You know, it's a byproduct of the metabolism that goes on in life. But Methane can also be generated what we call abiotically, in other words, not by life. Uh, so that can occur uh, when you have water, a certain type of minerals in, in a hot environment, a chemical reaction occurs and methane can be generated, has nothing to do with life. All right. So uh, phosphine was thought of indeed as one of those type of biomarkers. And uh, what we're finding, of course, is um, uh, phosphine uh, here on uh, here on Earth is generated by certain type of life in bogs, uh, and so um, uh, not all life generates phosphine. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, indeed, there's a type of life on Earth that does. So if we see it on another planet, could it also mean that there's life there? Well, it turns out volcanoes also generate phosphine. So there is an abiotic mm -hmm. way you can generate uh, phosphine. Uh, this is what my geologist friends tell me, uh, and volcanologist friends. And so consequently, you know, we want to know how active Venus is. Well, it turns out from a variety of spacecraft, one of which is the Japanese spacecraft, Takatsuki, uh, that, that's uh, there now, and um, uh, Venus Express, which, uh, which operated for many years up until recently, mm -hmm. really seemed to indicate that Venus still had a number of active volcanoes going on. So the detection of phosphine, although fascinating, needs one to be verified, you know, so we need to, more measurements to determine that's actually what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then two, we really need to figure out, is it generated 
uh, abiotically, or or is there other observations that can be made that would give it a credence to be generated biologically? So we have a lot of work to do on that. Now that that's sparking a number of ideas on missions. Mm-hmm. Now the phosphine that was seen was seen at high in the clouds. wasn't seen from um, uh, any any observation that would occur on the surface. So uh, that means that if there's life there, it may be hiding in the clouds so, mm-hmm. somewhere. So cloud life. That's kind of uh, uh, difficult to imagine, except for the fact that here on Earth, we actually have uh, some analogs of that. During certain storms, particularly in the Sahara, which can loft uh, dust high uh, also, microbial life, we find uh, when we launch high-altitude balloons that we see microbial life crossing crossing the ocean, coming over from Africa, you know, before it comes down, mm-hmm. you know. So the concept that that uh, s- small life, microbial life, might be hitching a ride and, and moving around Venus in the clouds is not, not as far-fetched as... One might think. So these are new discoveries, uh, new ideas, and and uh, we just need to continue uh, to pursue them and and through scientific evidence, then determine the valid uh, the validity of the concept of it being generated by life or not. If we were to get more comfort that it really may be a biomarker, how would one ultimately go about verifying it? Like, for example, it would be sent like a, some type of like atmospheric balloon into the Venus atmosphere? Or... Yeah, we've been talking about that. So uh, we actually, we've been talking about uh, Venus balloon now for uh, quite a few years before the phosphine observation came up. When I was head of planetary, uh, from 2006 to 2018, as, as I mentioned. But right around 2010, we started a dialogue with the Russians. The Russians were, you know, are well known for the, their ability to land on the surface of Venus. And they actually had yeah. some balloons that they had uh, worked for um, a period of time, not a long time, but, you know, hours on that order in the upper atmosphere. And so uh, we started a dialogue with them about what their next set of missions are, and, and we'd like to work with them on a Venus mission, perhaps late in the, late in this decade or early in the 2030s. That would be wonderful. And, mm-hmm. and balloons are a perfect venue for, for many of these kind of observations. Very, very interesting. Okay, so we, we've done Mars briefly, Venus. Let's, let's move to the moon, which we already mentioned, because there's so much activity scheduled to come on uh, on the moon starting later this year if i'm remember correctly with some of the robotic probes and then of course we have artemis on the horizon with a potential 2024 landing there but jim what are you most excited about um when you talk well uh, i'm excited about yeah thank you i'm excited about all those and and um uh, we're making incremental steps uh, that sometimes are pretty big not just so incremental but really big steps and we just did one just this last month. So we had four engines that are on the bottom of the space launch system. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a, this is the NASA rocket we're building. It's more capable than the Saturn V, which is the last big rocket that NASA built. You know, 10% more capable than, the, than our Saturn Vs. And these four engines had a, a number of new technologies associated with them. So we fired them. Uh, we want them to work for seven to eight minutes. That's what it takes to loft huge amounts of, of material out of our atmosphere and into space. Mm-hmm. And um, and we fired them for um, almost nine minutes. And they, they worked, well, from what we can tell, perfectly. And so this was called the green run, meaning that these new technologies, uh, they are very, if you're new, you're green, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you, you, it's that same kind of thought uh, that um, uh, in terms of um, how it's um, viewed. So the green run uh, tested these engines and, and it worked perfectly. That's huge. That's a huge step. That means we, we, can, we can work towards Artemis 1. Uh, you know, that'll be our first um, SLS launch with an Orion capsule, which will, without humans, which yeah. will go to the moon, go around the moon and come mm-hmm. back. And then we'll take that information and analyze it at, while we're building the next one, which will be um, Artemis 2. So we'll launch Artemis 2 with humans on the same basic trajectory. 
-hmm. after we did all the lessons learned from Artemis mm One. -hmm. And in the meantime, we're launching a number of, um, of, of missions to build a mini space station we call Gateway. Gateway, yeah. Which will which will be an outpost uh, that will orbit the moon and allow us then to dock, do experiments, live and work there. But more importantly, from that uh, vantage point, get down to the surface of the moon, and then hopefully we'll have uh, you know our first woman and the, and the next man walking on the moon here soon. Pretty exciting. Very very exciting. If you compare it to when we did it about you know 50 years ago. What would be sort of the, the, the things that evolved the most that are most different to, to 50 years ago? What part of the technology? Well, uh, the, the approach is going to be very different. The approach uh, in the Apollo era was um, uh, to be able to land, deploy instruments, uh, collect material and come back and be on, the, be on the surface no more than three days, okay? I think Apollo 17 was the longest at three days or so. Yeah. You know, our plan is to uh, go to the moon and be there not only just days, but uh, weeks, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a month or more. You know, these are current, the current thinking. We're developing capability to, to drive around on the moon, a base camp, if you will, Uh, with um, a habitat that uh, mm -hmm. then our astronauts will be able to go to and learn to live and work on a planetary surface. And the moon will be that first step. The next step beyond that, of course, would be thinking of Mars, but um, we're going to learn a lot from this experience that we, we will use in, in our Mars program. Yeah, so I mean, very exciting yeah. time coming up. If you do that, I guess, it's like you said, you set up a habitat, you need to have an environmental control, life support systems, all of, all of that needs to be set up, which hasn't been done before. It's like you said, the, the, the life support system of the Apollo missions was basically the lander, which is... That's right. Very different, very different environment. So I was going to, I yeah, was going to ask was, you. Oh, you know, it's like a skin, a you know, very thin aluminum skin. You could probably yeah. push it over. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, so we're going to have to have much more substantial things. The temperature variation between day and night on on the moon was huge, you know. And so these the, these things have got to be able to uh, be pretty rugged. What are we going to do about radiation protection, by the way? Because again, it's like the longer you stay, the worse that gets, obviously. Well, we monitor that. We know a lot about it. You know, one of the things that uh, many people probably don't realize is we had a radiation monitor on Curiosity okay. right on the rover. It's still on the rover and it's still working great. And so that means uh, we launched it. It, it. We measured radiation all during the time to its trip to Mars. It got down on the surface. We measured uh, what happens uh, every day, day after day, day and night on Mars. And so we, we've created a timeline of radiation that uh, the rover has, uh, has been exposed to. Uh, and we can therefore calculate the dose that a human would experience. And for that same time, You know, that same epoch, if it was a human rather than a rover, uh, we could we would increase their uh, probability of cancer from 3% to 5%. So it wasn't, a, it, it's not, it's not um, uh, in this particular scenario, a killer, you know, it's not a, it's not a killer event. Now, it doesn't mean there isn't huge storms that occur that could pose uh, major threats to life in space. Uh, we're we're aware, becoming more aware that the sun can be quite volatile at times, but we're also getting to the point where we're going to start predicting those. We're going to start studying the sun uh, to the point where we can understand it's now time uh, uh, to to be able to go to a safe room. Now we we understand also some of the uh, types of materials that will uh, provide a safe haven. It turns out one of the best ones is water. water. You can imagine going into a room surrounded by water. You need water anyway. anyway. And the water yeah. you use, you know, is is there to not only drink and use and recirculate, re recirculate that, uh, but also uh, be able to protect. So um, if I walked into a room of astronauts and I, I said, if you can, you, can go, you can go to Mars and in this mission profile, it, your, your uh, rate of cancer increase would be from three to 5%. How many are you are willing to go? Every hand in the room would go up. I can just guarantee it. <laughs> okay, so you think basically the radiation part of such a mission is, is, is solvable or is... 
we, we basically we, have to figure we, it out. It's a, it's a danger. It's something we're continually uh, recognizing that we need more information about, and therefore we have to monitor. So that's a continual thing. Um, but it's it's not what I would say a showstopper. Yeah. By the way, once we let's say we actually set up a settlement on places like the moon or or even Mars, here on Earth we have the pr the protection of our magnetosphere, right, against the the solar yep. events. So like most of the really bad particles, so to say, don't mm -hmm. don't even hit us, which is obviously currently not the case on the moon or or Mars. So if there was a if there were so severe solar events, is that sort of like a threat to future human settlements? And then hence you would need it to have can these be. safe rooms. Or? Yeah, yeah, it can be. But uh, as you say, you go to safe rooms. So what's okay. a safe area on the moon? You, well, if you build a structure above ground, it's going to have certain capability. But you can also leverage the fact that the lunar regolith is really a, a also a, a, a what we believe is a is a perfect insulator. So if you could get underground, you know, with maybe five meters of regolith above you, that's also going to be a safe environment. Now we we see on the moon lava tubes for which the roof have collapsed. You know, where a, a meteor has hit the roof, broken through. And we can look into these huge caverns, which mm -hmm. used to have, which used to be um, tubes where lava would flow down and then flow onto the surface of the moon. These, in particular, are around the mare. You know, the dark areas on the moon are actually a, a basaltic rock, a melted rock that's flowed into it, a magma that comes from the lower crust or upper mantle that's poured into these and, and come through these tubes. And these tubes, uh, we believe, have enormous number of benefits. You know, you can think of if you can get into one of these tubes, you can almost flow a habitat and then live and work in that, come and go out of the tube. Uh, uh, the tube would be uh, more than a safe environment against uh, solar storms. If you get warning ahead of time, uh, which uh, you may only need 20 minutes of warning or so to go from where you are into um, into uh, these lava tubes. So we already are aware how how important these might be for future, future uh, bases. We also recognize that the temperature inside one of these uh, these lava tubes seems to be about the same. Now, now if you're on the surface, you suffer huge temperature variations between sure. night and day. Yeah. Yeah. You move into it. Yeah. So, you know, you have a system that has to uh, heat you when the outside is cold and, and, and get rid of the heat when you're, you know, you're in the day side. So, but in a lava tube, you know, with a constant temperature, then then you have to be able to only uh, manage the, the, um, the temperature up to a certain point. Point. Uh, and that helps. That helps for the stability of uh, the electrical systems that you're developing. Now that we will have this, if, if all goes well, these, these tremendous heavy lift capabilities to, to the lunar surface ultimately, right, with the SLS and then obviously SpaceX, Elon is working on the Starship, which is a giant vehicle as well. And may even, they may even, well, they're trying to have orbital refueling, right, which could mean many, like a lot of tonnage to, to the moon. I mean, besides the obvious things like life support systems, is there anything else that you think we should take? Like, how should we use all of that potential transfer. Well, yeah. Oh, uh, the in what we call sustainability. We, we we're looking at what does it take to be able to sustain life on the moon for long periods of time. Well, that requires you know what we just talked about: the right atmosphere, the right protection, but also the ability to use um, the the material that's there to create new things. You know, and in that in that area, the lunar regolith uh, may be a really important set of material that we can use. In in our 3D printers, you know, and we can we can print some things that we need. That'll be important. Uh, we also are going to have to learn how to grow food in that environment. Now we'll have to probably take a significant amount of stuff uh, to be able to then uh, create a greenhouse environment. Uh, but but um, the ability to then um, have that work on the moon uh, would require additional resources like water. Do we take all the mm -hmm. water we ha we have here up there? Well, it turns out one of the reasons why we're going to the South Pole is that we believe 
in the uh, permanently shadowed craters is a significant amount of water that has accumulated over billions of years. In fact, the estimate is there are several hundred million ton of water uh, in these permanently shadowed craters. Well, that's a that's a fabulous resource to be able to get it, melt it, use it, use it uh, for agriculture, uh, use it for drinking. Uh, water is important to be able to split the hydrogen and the oxygen. You can breathe the oxygen, uh, hydrogen and oxygen. If you split it uh, from the water, you can use it as rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. So the concept of manufacturing uh, might also be uh, uh, what some of the things that we might do on the moon. We have that opportunity. Yeah. And that actually, that is, it's good you bring this up because that actually means if you want to do these things, the other infrastructure you need is sort of a energy generation infrastructure, right? Right. So remember it's well, solar cell, uh, another or... reason to go to the South Pole of the moon is uh, some of these regions on the moon are constantly in the sunlight in the South Pole. You know, the rotational axis of the moon is only a few degrees off from perpendicular to the sun. So that means there are areas that, that you actually could put a solar panel and always see the sun, always generate electricity. Uh, more advanced systems are being discussed, you know, where we'll use nuclear fuels of sorts to be able to um, uh, create power. Uh, uh, but um, uh, all that's in the mix, you know. All those are all those things are um, uh, very viable for us. So let me change tack a little bit. If you look at all of these sort of like uh, elements of a mission to the moon and and building sustainable life there, right, to the moon or Mars, all of the different elements, sort of in NASA in NASA speak, what would be like the lowest TIL, the lowest technology readiness parts where? we kind of need to put the most work in, either NASA or via its commercial partners? Well, indeed, uh, the power one, just the, the last one we talked about is um, uh, we're, we're doing some work in that particular area, working with the Department of Energy. You know, so what, and it's not solar panels, that we got. So it's mm. not like we don't have power, we'll have power. But if we want kilowatt power, you know, and for long periods of time, that's probably going to be in, in the nuclear energy area. And so what kind of systems can we use? What can we take? Uh, how would they be deployed? How much power can we uh, get from them? Um, uh, those are the kind of decisions, and, and that's, uh, that's under study uh, with a little development going on. So it's not something that we're going to implement right away. But we're doing making a lot of progress in, in developing um, uh, greenhouses that would be able to be uh, remotely uh, placed on the moon or even on Mars, for that matter, and a, a lot of work in in uh, um, how how to grow food, and uh, so that's that's come along real well. So a number of the things in the sustainability area is coming along pretty well. So if if we're kind of doing good work on all of these different elements, and so it's really a perspective in the foreseeable future that we can go to other places and build a sustainable. Um, settlement. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. Let's say the U.S. government appropriates like a trillion dollars. It like we all agree with Elon, we have to make humanity multiplanetary. Like we have to find like another location. Wh which one? Like we discussed Mars, we discussed Venus uh, atmosphere. We um, we actually we forgot to talk about the asteroid belt. There's some interesting ob objects there as well, like Cirrus. Right. We talked about Titan. Um, there's there's even um, the concept of the O'Neill stations. Why do you just have a space station where humans can live, like at a Lagrange point or something? Which one of these options would would you choose, and why to sort of like establish? Well, I, th I think uh, the really uh, big bet would be uh, Moon first, then Mars. Mars would be mm -hmm. the ultimate objective. Um, Mars is the planet that's most like us. It has uh, the ability to um, uh, sustain life more like us in an easier manner. It just has so many advantages uh, to it that uh, the, the uh, my overwhelming vote would be, uh, let's point uh, all our efforts to be able to go and live and work on Mars. And we do that, once again, by first learning to do that on the moon before we go to Mars. That, that buys down our rest. That makes complete sense. But if you want to stay there um, sustainably, would you be in favor of, of doing like large scale terraforming? Yeah. So as soon as humans show up anywhere, uh, then that process we call terraforming starts. It's a, it's a set of processes that make uh, the environment habitable for uh, life as we know it. Um, uh, so um, 
There's a lot of discussions about how to do that, what changes will be made on Mars as soon as we show up. Uh, and NASA's plan is to go to Mars in one location for long periods of time, you know, for decades. Unlike the Martian, where, uh, you know, every launch opportunity, they were at a different location. NASA's thought is we're going to go to one area and we're going to be there over and over again. And so we want to pick the best area that provides the, the most resources and capability for us. That we call an exploration zone. It's about 200 kilometers in diameter. We're going to land in one spot. We'll live in another spot. We'll use resources uh, within that area and we'll explore that area in doing a variety of new and exciting science activities. So um, that's our current plan. And that's, uh, that's going to take us, uh, you know, into the 2040s and 2050s and beyond. But anything, um, let's say, really ambitious, like creating an atmosphere, creating that magnetosphere, basically trying to, you know, replicate some of the elements of, of Earth, I, like the nice things of Earth, I guess, for humans. For current type humans? Well, right now, uh, there is a lot of work that's being done. Uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say a lot of work. Some work that's being done where we're taking a look at this, doing some fundamental research in this area. If we were to generate an artificial magnetic field, where would we put it? And how could it help fend off the solar wind? And what would be the result of that if we did? We know right now the solar wind strips atmosphere away from Mars uh, because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it. Uh, but what's happening is Mars has come to what we'd call an equilibrium. Uh, it outgasses, and the amount that it outgasses the solar wind strips, and that's where it's come to an equilibrium. And that equilibrium, is, as we talked about, is, is uh, produces an atmospheric pressure only about a percent of our own atmospheric pressure. We have to go up to a, a hundred thousand feet here on Earth to get to that same pressure. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty low. That's pretty low. But if you stop the solar wind stripping, then 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 a new equilibrium will come will come about. And, and, and we anticipate that then the pr atmospheric pressure of Mars will increase. If you increase the atmospheric pressure on Mars by itself doing it, by outgassing, that also means that the temperature has to go up. You know, pressure and temperature are very much related. So uh, that's, that's actually the beginning of the terraforming process by letting Mars do it itself. So one concept would be to put in a large magnetic field um, uh, from current systems and and put it at the Mars Lagrangian point L1 and fend off the solar wind. So that's a that's a crazy idea that's been um, floating around for a few years, and there's uh, actually uh, some work that's continually uh, going on in that area. So we'll see. That's that, that's super exciting. One one reason that people like Elon are proposing to the Mars right is sort of the to have another place where, in case, for example, like a, a large meteorite impacts the Earth, right? Like it has done many times in the past, and so. I, I think NASA has like a planetary protection group or something with, with a name like that as well. So how worried are you, Jim Green, about like asteroid impacts and, on, on Earth? Good question. So uh, 25 years ago, uh, I would think this planet should have been very worried about uh, meteoric impacts of large objects because we were ignorant as to what's out there. We're not so ignorant anymore. We know because in the last 25 years, we've really looked for near-Earth objects. Uh, we, we are tracking about 21,000 of them, okay? And some of them are really Really quite big. Some are what we would call planet killers. You know, something that would hit us, like like hit hit us in the past, killing 80% of the life in the current. Cretaceous period, and, and uh, the dinosaurs, you know, didn't have a space program, so they were pretty, um, uh, pretty susceptible to, the, you know, the uh, problems of asteroids hitting us and changing their food cycle. But um, some of these, and there's about 900 of them, are big enough to be able to do the same thing. We're tracking those. We found those, and we're tracking those. The smaller ones that could take out a city, we don't know where all those are, mm. okay? But um, we estimate the total number of uh, near-Earth asteroids we should be uh, monitoring and taking a look at 
is about 60,000. Now, currently, we know where 21,000 are, so we have a little work to do. Uh, but in that analysis, um, we don't see any we don't see any uh, big problems. We're we're going to be okay for the next several hundred years, and so long as we keep looking in the space, looking for them, uh, educating ourselves in terms of the ha- the hazards that these can, these can produce, and then working in areas which can defend the planet. And so this would be what we call planetary defense mm-hmm. by moving these asteroids out of the way that could be hazardous. And we have a number of projects where we're going to be doing that in the future. Then, uh, then I, I don't see that as a, a really, really big problem uh, in the future. Now, colonizing and going to another place like Mars is not like we should abandon Earth at all. Mm-hmm. You know, we are the first species that has the ability to leave the Earth and go into space, go to another area and really create a new civilization, a new culture, a new new set of activities, new, uh, u- utilizing the resources that are there and, and bringing in other resources to complement those and creating sustainable environments. We have the ability to do that. We should do it. And uh, that's why I think Mars is a great spot to, to, uh, to make a big step in the next 100 years. So I, I fully agree. But so with that vision of creating like an off-Earth settlement of humanity, so I, I always like to say that, um, you know, there's a big difference between uh, sending humans off Earth, right, which is what we're routinely and successfully doing for quite a while now, but ultimately the goal of sending humanity rather than individual humans, right, in, into space. And humanity right. for me, humanity for, for me, that's things like arts, sports, you know, everything sure. that kind of defines us as humans. And I, I, I come back basically to an astrobiology question, which I'm very curious about because I don't know the answer, to be honest. Like a very human activity, some people would say the most human activity is having families, having kids, re- reproducing. Mm-hmm. How much do we actually know about that in space from well, any, any species? Uh, yeah, yeah. Life, li- life has, um, you know, uh, life like us, uh, you know, carbon-based life, uh, we define as having three basic attributes. It metabolizes. That means it takes in food. With water, in this case, it's water. Could be any kind of liquid, though, for different types of life. And then that's a solvent. And we extract energy from that, and and the the liquid then eliminates the waste. So that's metabolism. So life has metabolism. The next thing is um, it reproduces and it evolves. And so it, it, that's just a fundamental aspect of um, of life is part of the definition of uh, uh, having families. So will we be able to do that in space? I mean, have we done any? any sure. Research? Why not? Why not? I don't know, because <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical expert, right? But maybe there is something that you, you need gravity for correct um, development. Okay. All right. All right. Or... Okay. All right. Cool. So, uh, uh, well, let me give you an example. On space station, we, we have found microbial life that's living inside a space station, and it is reproducing, and it is it is growing, it is living, it is uh, you know it, there's an ecosystem right there. <laughs> And I understand so, um, the big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just just from the fundamental aspect that that you know life will find a way, you know, as Jeff Goldblum says in, in yeah. Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, I believe he's right in this case. Okay. Well, fing, 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 fingers crossed. So let me um, let me finish with a couple of questions. One which I should really ask you: um, NASA has so many exciting missions coming up, right? Uh, Jupiter, yeah. icy moons, the DART, sure. um, the Titan mission we talked right. about. I know it's almost an unfair question, but which ones are you particularly excited about, if any? So uh, uh, I'll answer it the same way I did when I was head of planetary, and that would be, uh, you know, kids would uh, at the end of a public talk I'd give, I'd, I'd get uh, almost invariably a, a question from the kid, uh, from a child that would come up to the mic and ask me, uh, Dr. Green, what is your favorite planet? And I would always say, I love my children equally, okay? And the adults would laugh, and the kid would not be happy with that answer. Uh, but I have to tell you, I really, I, you know, there isn't a mission we don't do that ha- doesn't have, uh, you know, some uh, a seed of just some really exciting, new, innovative things, you know? And so it's it's really impossible then to say I like this one better than that one because um, uh, what we uncover and what we do uh, is so fascinating. And what we learn from that 
you know, we, we, we even though we have a few ideas of this is these are the questions, scientific questions we want to answer, and not only do we invariably find the answers to those, we find new things that we never dreamed we would run into, and that has unbelievable effects in the field. And this happens every time. And so consequently, uh, each mission should be looked at as not only from an exciting point of view, but from the excitement that it will generate, that we have no conceivable idea what it will Mm. be. And that unknown, uh, which we do know will happen, is what makes that mission equally important to to us. So let let me ask you the other way around then. So which <laughs> which potential mission is is missing at the moment right that when we would do if there was assuming like you had additional funding additional bandwidth additional scientists uh, what's the next mission we should do and that's that's not currently on All the right roster. in in the area in the uh, let me just pick an area and then move in that area so in the area of astrobiology i think the clipper mission will give us some indication of the habitability of europa and and with the thumbs up that that mm-hmm. they're that that is a very important habitable environment. If it does that, which I think it will do, then we need to get down on the ground. We need to get down near a crack where where which is an ice vent where material blows out mm-hmm. and and sloshes on top of the deck, and we bring that in and we analyze it and we find the life that we think might be there. So an instrument, uh, a sweet. A set of instruments on a spacecraft that sits on the on the surface of Europa would be a, a great next step. And then after that, building something that would slide down one of these cracks and actually go in to the ocean of Europa, like, like a submarine. Yeah, like a submarine. I like that. We'll we'll have all of these like different vehicles on in different places, right? Like helicopters on Mars and Titan, submarine on Europa, uh, sure. maybe balloons on Venus. And that, that, that'll be, we'll make it easier for the aliens that may want to detect us as life forms, right? Because we're leaving these, these artifacts behind. Which, on true. that note, let me come to my last question I always ask, um, right. which is about science fiction. And, you know, whether you like science fiction, and I'm going to assume yes, because you decided to help out the Martian. And uh, if, what your favorite science fiction is, and it could be books, it could be TV series, it sure, could be movies. Sure, sure. Well, I have to tell you, I, I, I don't read a lot of science fiction. But I, I do uh, enjoy many different types of science fiction. You know, when Oumuamua came through the solar system, I hadn't read uh, Rendezvous with Rama, which is um, the same concept. Arthur C. Clarke had this idea that one day we will find something coming from another solar system going through yeah. our solar system. I did not realize he'd written that until somebody had mentioned that to me. I read it, enjoyed that. Uh, but um, uh, I have to tell you, the, uh, Andy Weir's book, The Martian, uh, is uh, probably my uh, all-time favorite recent book. Um, and then other than that, it would be Dune. Um, oh, but, yes. Um, yes. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, Arrakis, the desert planet. You know, it's almost like Mars in many ways, where we think enormous amount of water is trapped under the surface of Mars. And we believe it's an aquifer. So, I mean, you know, it, it, there's just some parallels like that. You can't, you know, you know oh, we can't, we don't have any Fremen on Mars, but, but, uh, but in any event, there are some parallels that are just really fun to think about. Yeah. And this is when we suddenly find out via perseverance that uh, those th- the, the events that we thought were mass quakes are actually giant sandworms <laughs> could be well you know uh, insight is there and just recently it, it felt two pretty hefty earthquakes you there know you go. Yeah, 3.2 and 3.4 on the richter scale i think uh, you know so there was some shaking going on not too long ago Jim, uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show i also really want to point out to our listeners that you have your own podcast at NASA called Gravity Assist, and people should absolutely subscribe to that. You're going to learn a lot about uh, about the various types of science we talked about, astrobiology, planetary science, and so forth. Again, thanks, uh, Jim, thank you very much. My pleasure, Raphael. Well, that's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If the podcast got you interested in learning more about the business opportunities in the space economy, check out my new online course on space entrepreneurship 
on udemy.com. The link is in the episode description. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell, or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.